Does anybody here have a smartphone? I don't need to make a call, but I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that probably every one of you has at least one, and if you're really popular, you have two. Now, the reason I bring this up is the camera that's in your smartphone is built on small aperture technology. So whether you knew it or not, you actually all have adopted small aperture, uh, aperture optics into your life, and you're using it daily to memorialize important things like dessert from last night. At AccuFocus, our emphasis is to bring this type of vision correction to patients. So we want to think differently in order to provide an outcome for patients that's different than what they're getting today. The traditional methods for vision correction are all built around the same theme, really uh, using magnification or refraction in order to influence vision. So providing essentially uh, an in-focus image on top of an out-of-focus image when you think about multifocal IOLs. By contrast, what small aperture does for patients in a visual application is it essentially focuses or filters out that organized focus light and provides that clear and independent of the blur from those mid-peripheral light rays that defocus that image quality, providing an extended depth of focus. And not only do you get range of vision, but you get good quality of vision across that same spectrum. Now, when we look at how to apply this, AccuFocus has placed it into two different platforms, one with our camera inlay for presbyopia correction and the IC8 IOL for uh, cataract patients. Well, let's talk first about the corneal inlay market. Uh, we've been at this for a couple years. We were the first inlay to be approved in the US in 2015. And since that time, we've been focused on developing clinical confidence with our clinics. We actually took a pause earlier this year. I reported that at the OIS meeting previously, because we really wanted to ensure that from clinic to clinic, that the outcomes that patients and clinicians were seeing were the same. And I'm happy to report here at this meeting that we've achieved our goal. And now what we can expect and what surgeons can expect is that patients are achieving a J, uh, J2 and 2025 in their inlay eye at week one and 2020 and J2 binocularly at that same time point, and those outcomes are maintained over the long term. So our emphasis for the inlay at this point has now switched to helping those practices to identify patients who would be good candidates. And what we find is that there are patients uh, that exist within the practices already. Uh, accounts are doing uh, data analysis, mining their databases for patients that have had a history of good monovision contact lens experience, and reaching out to those patients and, and actively converting them. So that's what our emphasis is on today, having achieved confidence. So we're very happy where we're at with the inlay in the market, and we're looking to grow that as we move into 2018. When we look at the IOL marketplace, very busy, uh, and our effort here has been somewhat similar to the inlay in that we are going deep before we go broad. And we're focused our efforts on key markets in Europe, in the UK and Germany, as well as Australia and New Zealand. And what we've decided to do is to work with a select group of surgeons to help us truly understand how does this lens fit in the marketplace when there are, I think, 20 IOLs, premium lenses, that are available in Europe, for example. So how do we fit in that space? And what we've found is that when it comes to performance, the IC8 IOL provides both excellent and uh, distance and intermediate vision, as well as good near vision. These results were reported in the July issue of the JCRS that just came out uh, this summer. And the additional findings we have from that study have been very interesting, and that's sort of driving how the adoption and utilization of this lens is, is proving forward in the commercial uh, spectrum. And that is that the lens is able to tolerate as much as a diopter of a missed refractive target and it can also accommodate for the effects of up to a diopter and a half of corneal cylinder. So what that means is that this lens provides a real soft landing point for surgeons and also a, a, a real guarantee, if you will, for achieving some range of vision for patients. So it's not as difficult to achieve a happy outcome as it is, say, with other multifocal type of uh, solutions for vision correction. Now, when we start with uh, accounts, I think they're kind of taking the exact opposite approach that they would when they want to start with, say, a, a, bif a bifocal or a trifocal. They're starting with their most difficult patients. Now, this terrified us because who wants to have a keratoconic patient or a you know 16 cut RK patient be the first one that your lens technology is used in? Uh, but after we took a breath and we saw the outcomes, we we're really encouraged to see that these really difficult eyes who would put any lens through their paces are actually seeing equivalent results to those achieved by the virgin eye patients that we re uh, reported on in the JCRS issue. Uh, and that's really emboldened us to see what's the true potential of this lens to be a sort of medical therapy for this population of very underserved patients. Uh, so 
good news is when we start there with the clinic, you know, eventually we do move on to those more regular virgin eye patients once they see the outcomes with this difficult category. You know, we've actually taken a moment to really look at, you know, if this is how surgeons are utilizing this lens, uh, what does that mean for the positioning of the lens in the marketplace? And if I can get my slides back, that would be great. Uh, and what we've uh, uh, undergone is an analysis of what's the size of the aberrated cornea space. <laughs> Next slide. Thanks, Bill. Uh, you know, one of the metrics that we use or one of the factors that we uh, use for determining what is an aberrated cornea is the laser vision correction market. So I want to thank MarketScope for their help uh, with this uh, information. Um, the population, as we all know, laser vision correction is, is huge in the United States. And this subset of patients that were treated between 2001 and 2007 are all now within the presbyopic age range and rapidly approaching cataract age. And so what that means is there is a huge bolus of patients that our lens may be uniquely able to uh, help as we move forward and those patients become cataract age. When we look at the overall spectrum as we define aberrated cornea, that would include everything from uh, laser vision correction, keratoconus, patients that have uh, aberrations in the cornea that are as much as 0.3 microns. There's a surgeon in Europe who's actually used 0.3 uh, as her decision criteria between using a trifocal versus using our lens. Uh, and we've kind of calculated that in the U.S. to represent about 11% of the market today. Uh, so if you think about the slide I just shared with you, 11% today, it's only going to grow as we move forward. So we we really need a solution for this population of patients, and we believe, based on how our lens is being used commercially, that this is where uh, our lens will fit really well within the market. So creating new category with a corneal inlay and entering into a very populated and heavily competitive space with the IOL is not easy. But if Apple and Google can adopt small aperture, small aperture technology and get all of you to adopt it in your daily lives, so can we. Thank you. Thank you.